something is wrong, and it's time to stand up. You are listening to The John Age Show. Trust no one. Trust no one. Trust no one. You found it. You're here. You're headlong down the runaway train that is the Anomic Age. I'm your host, John Age. Happy to be back with you once again in the not-so-wee hours of the p.m. Got a great guest. We got Jay Widener, God willing, hopefully coming up with uh, with the technical issues I'm having. But uh, before we get into that, please check out anomicage.com. You can find all things me. Like all the likes, subscribe to all the subscriptions. Share those links, friends, family, loved ones, and enemies. PayPal.me forward slash Anomic Age, Patreon.com forward slash Anomic Age as well. You can find all the shows, all the video, all the audio, the shorter information breakdown segments, and so much more at AnomicAge.com. Without further ado, Jay Widener is a renowned filmmaker, author, and scholar, considered to be a modern day Indiana Jones. For his ongoing worldwide quests to find clues of mankind's spiritual identity via ancient societies and artifacts. His body of work offers great insight into the circumstances that have led to the current global crisis. He's a writer, director of the feature film The Last Avatar, director of the critically acclaimed documentary Infinity. The Ultimate Trip, Journey Beyond Death, and writer-director of the documentary series on the work of Stanley Kubrick. Thank you so much, Jay. Let's give it a shot. Are you there? Yep. Thank the Lord yeah, you're here. here. Good grief. The, the technology <laughs> gremlins have stopped for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. It, it's been too long, and yeah. it's, it's definitely an honor to have you back on. Yeah, it's good to be back. <clears throat> Well, one of the many things that I've kind of been touching on lately is is the cultural manipulation, the cultural control, if you will. And I know this thing is not uh, not something that's just been going on the last twenty or thirty years, which is what a lot of people would think if they've just been uh, new to the to the information that's been falling out. This has easily been a centuries old <clears throat> quest, if you will. Yeah. So much of this, yeah, I mean. On the Frankfurt School, but I know your your work goes back into the archaeological realm, the ancient societies, all this stuff. How how is this thing uh, really connecting out? Could you flesh out or put any of these pieces on the on the board, if you will? Well, it's it's really um, it's 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 a spiritual war, and they're using culture as the battlefield, and. Um, and since they made the culture, pretty much, uh, it's easy for them to manipulate that culture. And things got um, got uh, very serious uh, after World War II is when this thing took a big upswing. Uh, the uh, German experiments on mind control, the MK Ultra programs, had been imported into the United States by Operation Paperclip. And um, uh, and then the Frankfurt School uh, came into being, and th together this created uh, what we call the modern world. And the modern world is um, something far removed from the natural world. And so they um, they show who they are by you know, what they do, and it's, it's clearly apparent that whoever is behind all of this is um, anti-human, uh, anti-nature, um, anti-spiritual, um, in every kind of way, even though they may think that they're, they have some, some kind of spiritual, uh, spiritual spirituality about what they're doing, um, they don't. And when you start getting down to it, they're just whole hard, cold. Um, uh, I hate to say it, but they're um, uh, 
degenerates. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what it is. Um, there's a movie out right now called Babylon, which is about Hollywood in the 1920s and 30s. And it's a horrible film. I'm not recommending it for anybody. But, um, you know, it shows these people, you know, exactly what they're like and what they were like and how long they've been with this doing these same things. So it's, I, I believe the movie's based on Kenneth Anger book, Hollywood Babylon, which is a history of Hollywood from the 1920s and 30s, of which is probably one of the more lurid books you'll ever read in your life. Hmm. <coughs> and um, there were, in Hollywood in the 1920s, according to Kenneth Anger, there were transsexuals. <clears throat> Almost everybody was gay. They were all snorting cocaine. There were orgies night and day, um, seriously unhealthy lifestyle. And this is in the 20s. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what this is. And, you know, so over and over again, we find the same uh, shady characters appearing. Uh, right now, I'm doing a deep dive into one of the more shady characters that came out of all of this, which is the writer J.D. Salinger, um, mm. author of Catcher in the Rye. Yeah. Uh, J.D. Salinger worked for the OSS in World War II uh, as an agent uh, for the intelligence. And then he spent five years after World War II, quote, denazifying Germany. Well, since Germany is where all this stuff came from, where the experiments were performed originally on the new modern version of all this stuff, um, you have to feel that J.D. must have come into contact with the MK Ultra programs and the, uh, all of those programs. And we know that when um, Mark David Chapman shot John Lennon, um, he, uh, John Lennon lay bleeding on the sidewalk and he calmly pulled out catcher in the rye and started reading it and waiting for the cops to come to arrest him. Uh, Hinckley, who shot Reagan, same thing. He shot Reagan and he just calmly pulled out catcher in the rye and read it. Hmm. And, um, catcher in the rye is featured heavily in the beginning of the movie, the shining by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, Wendy, Shelley Duvall is reading it. That's right. Um, I completely forgot about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to make a whole, uh, a, a, a new Kubrick movie, based on all of this coming out real soon. Um, and um, so we see that they're using culture as a way to change and alter us, change and alter society. And they, they do it through slate of hand. The thing that's going on now and what's so amazing about what, what's going on now and has been going on for at least the last three years is they're no longer hiding it. They're just right out in the open, lying, lying, outright lying. We'll just say, I, 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 I'm going to, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? This is exactly their attitude, that we are the ones who can't look at the January 6th footage and see what's going on. We have to wait for them to interpret it. Then we find out that they never even watched it. So um, they were just making surmises on stuff that they hadn't even seen. And uh, so we're moving now into where they're uh, taking off the masks. Uh, they're no longer hiding. Uh, they're revealing themselves as a kind of, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I, I balk at saying this, but I don't know what choice I have anymore. A, a clearly a Luciferian agenda. And so what is a Luciferian agenda? Then, you know, I mean, I don't know what it is. Um, uh, but what it seems to be, and it seems to all this modern inculcation of the cultural destruction of humanity seems to come from Aleister Crowley. That's all I can say. I, I, I trace it all back, and it seems as if Aleister Crowley, who was a fundamentalist Christian, raised a fundamentalist Christian, and then rebelled against it. His dad was quite a, um, a fierce Christian and would beat him and stuff. He rebelled against it. He joined an already existing occult thing um, that we already know existed, and he took it over. And his purpose, and he says it quite clearly, is to destroy Christianity. 
He says mm-hmm. it quite clearly over and over in his books. And he said he will do use any tool available to accomplish his goals, <clears throat> including killing children, which he clearly says he, that he does in his book and getting their power off of them. So we see that, um, uh, uh, that, uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, Jimmy Page bought Aleister Crowley's house on Loch Ness and lived there for, I think he's still living there, actually. Yeah. We see that um, uh, Paul McCartney, you know, has uh, 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 Aleister Crowley on Sgt. Pepper's right behind him, right? Uh, it was 20 years ago today. Aleister Crowley died exactly 20 years ago before Sgt. Pepper's. Aleister Crowley was t- talking constantly about a new future where everybody's on psychedelics mm-hmm. where, the, where the magic of psychedelics is spread everywhere who spread psychedelics the beetles spread psychedelics what is a beetle beetle is a, a egyptian scarab yeah. um uh in which alistair crowley was uh you know he wasn't an expert he thought he was an expert in egyptian history but he wasn't because we've learned so much more since then that what he knew is just scant compared to what we now know so he used these um, psychological, spiritual manifestations to uh, redo the culture. And um, Paul McCartney, in his memoirs, um, you know, went to um, um, Brian Epstein, the manager of the Beatles, and said, what is the point of the Beatles? And Brian Epstein looked at him and said, to destroy religion. And we know that John Lennon said we're more popular than Jesus. And um, uh, uh, and John Lennon hated Christianity, although he may have altered that view right near the end of his life. Um, it looks like he suddenly became a conservative in his late 30s yeah. and actually said he would have voted for Reagan. But that happens. You know, you're, you're a liberal in your 20s and 30s, and then you start paying taxes and seeing how your money is spent in your late 30s and early 40s, and boom, you're no longer a liberal anymore. It happens all the time. It happened to me. I mean, you know, at, at 40, I was done. But anyway, so it's very fascinating to watch the explicit nature of what they're doing now. That's what's the most fascinating part. The um, The ads. The ads, the television ads, are so fascinating. Um, all the ads feature women doing men's stuff, mm-hmm. like they're auto mechanics. Like, who would want to be an auto mechanic? I <laughs> mean, like, wish the hardest job on earth is auto mechanic. You have to have tons of upper arm strength, first off, to do it. So, it's very unlikely a woman would ever be able to. Uh, work on a car very well, at least not for more than a few weeks before she'd be completely tired out. Yeah. Uh, 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 every, everything is multiracial in the ads, which is fine. I don't care about that. Mm-hmm. But what I find interesting is that all the white males have red hair. In other words, you watch ad after ad after ad. And you have to, if you watch YouTube. So he's like, ah, I can't stand this. And, um, uh, and you're like, Oh, here comes the redheaded male. Always. And they're always kind of wimpy. Mm-hmm. They're redheaded and they're kind of wimpy, slight bodies. And they're, the white males are always the foible in the commercial. They're the ones that get hit. They walk into the glass door or, you know, they're always the one that's making some kind of screw up. And then all the races are looking around like, ah, oh, that poor dummy. Right. And, <laughs> and, right. And, 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 and so you say, okay, well, how can all the advertising agencies all do all of this? So there's 50, 100 agencies on Madison Avenue, okay? How can they all be doing the same exact thing, right? Yet they are. And then we go back to the famous, which is now a scrub from the internet, but the famous letter from a record producer who was a 
we don't know who he was. He was anonymous in this letter, but he says in the letter that he was a very famous record producer in the 1980s, 1970s and the 1980s. He produced a lot of the top acts. He said, we got called to a meeting at the LA Marriott Hotel and all the producers were called to this meeting and we got called to this meeting and the head, top head of the record company came up and said, we're no longer going to be producing rock and roll. From now on, everything is hip hop. If you don't want to produce hip hop, then you can just walk out now. Your job and your career are over because that's where we're going. If you don't like it, too bad. Yeah. And he quit. He didn't like hip hop. Okay. So you can see that everything's being directed from the top is what I'm trying to get to. There's mm -hmm. somebody at the top of the pyramid saying, okay, everybody, if you're going to show a white male, he has to have red hair. Why? I have no idea. No idea. Don't understand it. But it is, um, it is odd that we're talking, th that they're doing that. And at the same exact time, the alternative history people like me um, are because of Vladimir Putin's release of the Tartarian maps in 2013, we are now aware of a country that never has been taught to us in our history books, a giant country in, called Tartaria, which was in Russia and China, okay? And it, and it ruled the world. It was a giant country, and the people all had red hair. Hmm. It's like weird. Genghis Khan was probably a Tartarian, and he is reported to have pale white skin and red hair. All right. And he's not an Asian is what I'm saying. Yeah. And if you go to the if you go to the Great Wall of China, right, which the Chinese say they built to protect themselves from the barbarians. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, there's something very interesting about the Great Wall of China. And that is, is that about every 200 yards or so, there's a little a little um, room. And that's a room where the guard goes to get out of the rain or the snow. Right. So every 200 yards, there's this little room, right? It's a little about three feet by three feet, like a phone booth a little mm -hmm. bit, and um, made out of brick. And um, the odd part is, is that the guard towers are on the barbarian side of the wall, not the Chinese side of the wall. Uh, why would you do that? Because the wall was not built to keep the barbarians out. The wall was built to keep the Chinese out of Tartaria. That's what it was built for. And it's a Tartarian construction. Wow. And if you look at the Tartarian construction, you can see that they use the brick exactly like they use it on the Great Wall. Um, and, you know, and we're beginning to understand that, that, that the Tartarians had, um, you know, giant metal towers coming out the top rods out of all their buildings. And we're now realizing that they were collecting electrical etheric energy and bringing it down and using it. And that they had fireplaces with no chutes, no chimney chutes. You're like, what's this big, huge fireplace doing here? And there's nowhere for the smoke to go yeah. because that's not what it was. What it was, they had heating devices in there and then they took the electricity down and they put it into the heating devices. Wow. And so then you have to ask yourself, well, why did the USSR uh, create a, a, a bureau that was, was designed for just one purpose? And that was to destroy all memory of Tartaria. Why would the Soviet Union, in their inception in 1918, be, this be one of their very first acts, is to destroy all remnants of Tartaria, right? Why did Putin release the maps? Putin, who absolutely cannot stand the Bolsheviks, um, has gone ranting and raving about them, uh, how, how horrible they are. And don't forget, those Bolsheviks came from Ukraine. Yeah. Just saying. They came from Ukraine. They invaded Russia from Ukraine slowly over hundreds of years, but they did. And um, and so we see that there's a force on Earth that doesn't want us to improve ourselves, doesn't want us to um, be healthy. Um, and, you know, you'd say, OK, so there's a group of people on Earth who have acquired political power, and there is, 
um, and they uh, don't like us, and they're going to kill us all and take over the world. This is the, the conspiracy theory. Well, it doesn't make any sense. First off, if they kill us all, they're not going to have their high-tech world. This iPhone takes 10,000 people to make, hmm. all right? It's made in over 75 countries. That's how long and uh, how complex this technology is, okay? You need people everywhere. You, you need thousands of people to keep your high-tech society going. It's not going to run by automatic. Everything runs down. It's the law of entropy. So you think that you're going to be able – so they're – and they're making a series of uh, mistakes that are going to uh, cost us dearly, like the electric cars, electric vehicles. Absolutely makes no sense at all. No sense at all. There's not enough electricity generated in the United States for everyone to have a car. What are the people in Manhattan going to do? Throw a, a 300-foot uh, cable out their window so yeah. to, to charge their car at night? All the apartment buildings are going to have hundreds of cables coming down to charge everybody's car that's parked out on the street. You just, they'll, 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 they just have not thought this out. They think they've thought it out, I think. But I can't see where they're going. And then when you look at the rare earth uh, minerals that they need for the batteries— you're literally going to have to destroy the planet to create the batteries needed for this. And in the end, I hate to say this because it's a heresy, but gasoline is far cleaner than any of the uh, uh, other things that they're talking about. Um, windmills are terrible. They're filling up their uh, landfills with their blades. They, uh, everything has to be replaced every two years on windmills, all the ball bearings and everything. Um, it, we're being sold like a future that can't work. And they're using culture to sell it to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even the, you know, the, I don't want to go, the stuff where, Boys can be girls and girls can be boys, all right? Yeah. How is that good for – I'm not saying we shouldn't let people do whatever they want because I think we should. I'm inherently a libertarian, but how is that good for society? Did, don't we have like a duty to make a healthy society that um, – where people aren't on hormones for their whole life, beholden to the pharmaceutical industry their whole life, which is what this is. And then, you know, if, if, if everything is qui bono, who benefits, then you have to look at the boys are girls and girls are boy thing and saying, well, who benefits? And the beneficiary, the chief beneficiary is the pharmaceutical companies. They're raping it in the profits from all of this. And, and, and those, they're stuck on it for their whole life. Just like a diabetic has to take insulin, they have to take hormones for the rest of their life. And, uh, I, and we don't even know what the long-term effects of that is. We've never, ever done studies on this. So we're, you know, willy-nilly going and doing things without any procedure. And the ones that are doing it are telling us that they're following the science when actually they're not following any science at all. It's just kind of an insane. And so in the end, I came down to it. No, human beings would not be in charge of this. They're not smart enough. <laughs> so then I have two choices. I can go spiritual or I can go aliens. And um, I'm assured by very high up sources in the intelligence and the military that there is an alien force mm -hmm. out there that is um, not necessarily our friend. And uh, other than that, I can't really find anything else out. And then again, you could do, uh, you could uh, make it both spiritual and practical. You could say that Lucifer is an alien, and therefore then this is alien. And then why would they want to remove uh, Christianity? Um, my guess is that um, as long as you are holding on to a belief that there's another life after this life that you will this imbues the person with a a, a degree of courage that other people who are atheists and non-believers do not have mm. they don't have it now, i believe in an afterlife I, and and i believe that you pay for what you do in this life in that 
afterlife. Uh, I don't believe in it in a strictly a Christian sense, but it is quasi-Christian in that I believe that I will be judged for what I do here. And uh, that judgment will be severe. And um, most likely it's, I, ha- I, will ha- I think the, ju- the severeness of that judgment is that you have to live through the pain that you caused everybody, which I think is really kind of a very just way to do it. So if you were uh, um, a guy who screwed a lot of people over, well, you're going to go live all those people's lives that you hurt, right? Yeah. And so the force that is here is trying to remove the things that make us good and the things that, and, and so you think, why, why would it be doing that? And then, you know, is it because if you're good and you're honest that you will not be able to live in the world that they want us to live in. And so, and if you're not afraid of death, well then what the hell? You know, then you're really dangerous. And Michael Corleone said it in The Godfather. Oh, you're an honest man. That means you're dangerous. Yeah. So, yep. And that's what it is. And so it, it would appear to me, especially after watching like the stuff at the Grammys and the Super Bowl and everything, that we are in the grips of an anti-life, anti-human force that seeks to destroy us through through any means necessary and will do anything to destroy us. And this is what all the madness that's going on around us right now, to me, is clear that's what's going on. And, um, and I don't know how to fight back against it. I mean, you can argue with people, but what good does that do? Um, uh, everybody is set in their sanctimonious way so people who want, you know, minors to have surgery think that they're fighting for their rights. So they're sanctimonious. And those who think that uh, having surgery, and by the way, I'm against surgery. All right. I think that only at a last resort do you want to have surgery um, to save your life. But surgery itself is uh, uh, slashing open the human body with a metal object is really bad on your spiritual part of you you're slashing into your your soul and your spirit and and that's why you, you know you can actually lose your spirit through that mm-hmm. and which is weird because you know tattooing is the same thing and tattooing is a horribly painful experience where a lot of blood is lost and you're attacking the body with uh, chemicals, uh, uh, chemicals that are probably not good for you. Yet, you know, it's encouraged now everywhere for everyone to have tattoos. And I'm not against tattoos. Um, there's actually, you know, like the Maori of uh, New Zealand, their their tattooing is to show the um, the etheric body mm-hmm. around their body. So they they do spirals and things on their tattoos. So there are tattoos that have very very healing properties, but you know, uh, putting mom on your arm, I don't know. Probably not doing that much. <laughs> that's a trick. But anyway, that's my tirade about the cultural war. And, and my conclusions uh, that I'm reaching here, that we are definitely. Um, here's another thing. A large part of my work is about this cross in the south of France, mm-hmm. which predicts a solar flare that's going to happen in the future and has happened in the past. And we know that that there's evidence of it. Dr. Robert Schock, Boston University, wrote a whole book about it. Uh, he went all around the world and found evidence for gigantic solar flare hitting the Earth about 12,000 years ago. The cross at Hende predicts it. it's imminent, it says, in the future. And the cross of Hende was inserted into the book in 1957. And in 1958, we started the International Geophysical Year, we, um, uh, we, we started mapping the oceans. We uh, began the deep underground military bases. We began NASA. Okay, all within a year after this Cross of Hende chapter comes out, saying that we're on the imminent collapse of the world. So what is going on? Well, what's going on is that they have no intention of paying back the debt. 
they, they are in a runaway spendthrift because they think that the sun is about to go. All right. Mm -hmm. And the sun had gone from yellow to white in the last 25 years, which is alarming, to say the least. And no one talks about it. Not even solar physicists talk about why is the sun white now when it used to be yellow. Right. And I can pull I can pull you out poetry from 1750. Oh, the yellow sun that sits in the sky. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, children's books uh, going back hundreds of years, all of them describing the sun as yellow. But the sun isn't yellow anymore. It's white. So what does that mean? Well, generally when things go white, that means they're getting hotter. Tip of the flame is the whitest part of the flame at the very top. That's the hottest part. So I would say that the sun is getting hotter and, um, uh, and they know it. And the secret space program and the deep underground bases and the, uh, the absolute flagrant spending uh, without any intention of paying anything back is all part of a way to escape the coming catastrophe. So it's like they let go. It's like they just let go of the world. And so the things that, um, that guide us as a society are disappearing. Mm. And so the central operating principles that guided us are no longer in effect. And they're not being guarded. We, we, how many of us feel like we can go in, front, in, a, in a courtroom now and feel that we're going to get justice in anything from a parking ticket to anything, not right? You don't, you don't feel it. You feel like you're not going to get justice. And so um, it's like they're all... Um, getting ready for some kind of catastrophe and they're going to buoy and go into the mountains in Colorado or in, in their underground bases or off to who knows what with their secret space programs yeah. and, um, and leave us behind uh, uh, to deal with it. And that's what I think is going on. I think that's a combination of super evil forces and then people, um, lackadaisical attitude towards everything because they think that it's all going to come to an end very soon. And yeah. it may come to an end very soon. We are overdue. And, um, and, and, and they don't want you to think about any of this. Graham Hancock series on Netflix, apocalypse, future apocalypse. Yeah. Right. He got, he's a good friend of mine. He got roasted. I've never seen anyone get roasted. And I'm like, wait a minute. Everything he's saying is true. All that evidence is really there. I've been there. I've seen it. And How the do you archaeological explain? evidence substantiates this. I mean, that's kind of what I wanted to get into a little bit is, is we know that the, the Hitlerian connection with the occult, we know the people brought it over with Operation Paperclip and uh, the rat lines and so forth. But all that really had a deeper uh, archaeological and cultural connection. Excuse me. If you look at, for example... Um, Teotihuacan, Egyptians, the Greeks, even the, the big sites like Cahokia. There's so many of these sites all over the world that everybody agrees. Like, yeah, everybody just disappeared or it all burned down one day and we're not really sure why. And there seems to be a, a parallel with a lot of um, plumed serpent gods with a lot of these major sites as well. Specifically, Mexico, Mesoamerica, and you can parallel that with Egypt as well. So I think... Once again, connected back to that history and uh, the obfuscation of Tartuffe, they don't want you to know the real history of these sites either, because that might sort of unleash the elephant in the room, and people might go, "What? Well, what? What's? What's going on? It looks like we're all doomed here." Yeah, and that was, you know, okay. So, so Hitler, uh, I want to use that name, <laughs> the Chancellor yeah. of Germany, visited the Cross of Hende in 1940. Um, he took a train trip across newly conquered France, and he stopped at Rennes Chateau, a, a mystical site in south of France. He stopped at where the Holy Grail uh, is purported to be buried at Mont Segur in France, and he stopped at Hende. And when he stopped at Hende, he immediately took his two German shepherds, went right up the hill, which is like three blocks away from the train station, to the cross of Hende, where supposedly he met someone, and they had a two-hour discussion near the cross of Hende. All right, so Anunnabi, which are the SS occult forces, 
That's what they did. They went everywhere. They went to Peru, to Tibet, to uh, Northern Africa, to all the places in France. Um, they went to every sacred site on earth and, and, and did huge amounts of research on it, all under the guise of, uh, oh, well, we're getting ready for the war and all this. And like, what are you doing in Tibet? Mm -hmm. Right. And um, and what are you doing in Peru? What are you doing in the mountains of Peru? What do you think? What do you? Why do you send you know five thousand guys there? Well, what's the point of that? I thought you were trying to win a war. There's no, nothing going on in Peru, but just what Machu Picchu. we know they were doing in Peru because uh, one of the Native Americans was working with them, and he got his story out um, in the fifties. They were looking for underground. Uh, tunnels and stuff in the mountains, the Andes Mountains. And that's what they were looking for in Tibet. Uh, FDR sent Nicholas Rorick, the artist, to Tibet to find the underground passages. The, 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 the uh, Lama said that when Rorick would come visit him, all he wanted to talk about was how to get down into the underground. So FDR, who's a 33rd degree Mason, is also... Um, just like Hitler and just like everybody, I guess, maybe at that time was looking for the underground. Why? Mm -hmm. Because all the knowledge of the end of the world that they were finding, which is what they were finding and what they were doing, um, suggested that you better get underground that you, you get, and you better be high up. That was the two things. Well, there's going to be tidal waves and there's going to be solar flares and you got to get away from both. And the only way you can get away from both is get up high and get underground. And so that's what they're doing. This is the problem with the uh, deep underground military bases. They're going to get flooded or mm -hmm. whatever. So, you know, the solar flare hits one side of the earth and it pushes the oceans over and sloshes them over into the other side of the earth. So one side is hit by fire and one side is hit by water. <laughs> right. And, um, the side that got hit by fire the last time was North America. That I mean, there's 18 inches of ash in the Canadian forests, so it must have been the most glacial burn ever. And um, uh, plasma storms are what created the American Southwest. Uh, that is the direct action of lightning, gigantic lightning strikes, which which is what will happen when this solar thing happens. Uh, and it won't be from lightning like we have. It'll be lightning from the sun, huge bolts of lightning coming from the sun, creating the Grand Canyon, um, blowing out the whole entire American Southwest, Arches National Park, uh, Sedona, all those. That is not wind erosion. All those fo weird forms out there. Yeah. I live right near there. Um, that is exactly what rock looks like when it's been struck by heavy amounts of electricity. It literally it looks just like the American Southwest. We've done experiments and we've seen. So, and and, and here's the thing about the American Southwest is that we have Native American pictograms of plasma storms hmm. all over the American Southwest. Um, John, oh, I'm going to forget his name, plasma physicist from Los Alamos was the first guy to discover this. Um, he was doing plasma experiments in the lab in vacuum hmm. chambers, and then he went to look at a Native American Southwest art in uh, Santa Fe one day with his wife, and he's like, what? They're painting the plasma storms. And then he started looking at pictograms and realized that all over the American Southwest and all over the world, uh, in Africa, Australia, South America, are the same exact uh, plasma pictogram storms. And um, how long does it take for a pictogram to erode off of a rock? I think that's the question you have to ask because... If it's a thousand years, then these were only a thousand years old. If it's three thousand years, then there's, the storm happened three thousand years ago or more, right? But how long does a pictogram go before finally it's eroded away? So I'm suggesting is that the storms are earlier than we may think. That um, and they may be more often than we think, and uh, and I think we're headed that way. I think we're we're going towards this thing and the elites know it and uh, they're doing everything they can to pretty much cut us loose. And that's what we're seeing. If they, and they're causing as much confusion as possible in the wake of them leaving. 
So, uh, you know, is Joe Biden really the president? You know, is, you know what I mean? I mean, all these things can be asked in, in, in a real sincere way. I mean, who is that guy? And what is his agenda? Yeah. And um, you can see he clearly doesn't care. And, um, you know, we look at the, the tragedy of uh, East Palestine, mm -hmm. Ohio, and, you know, those who are in the know know that all of the farms around that chemical spill were organic Amish farms. And they're all out of use forever. They can never be in use ever again. And we don't know how wide it, the, the damage was, but I think it was extensive. And the reason that they did the burn is because if we found out actually what was in those trains, it would be high crimes. And so they burned it right away without any permission from anybody. Nobody's claiming that they did it. And so, you know, and, and nobody cares. So they're bailing out the Silicon Valley billionaires and leaving the rest of us to our own, uh, you know, our own measures. And it's wholly and completely as if the federal government is like uh, against us, or we're their enemy or something. I don't know. Yeah. And I think sort of the weird thing for me as I've sort of gone through the process of all this over a few decades now is this sort of that, that cognitive dissonance that everything you thought was legitimate and just a grassroots organization and, and music and culture and so forth was all so contrived. I mean, if you want to go back oh. to, to Tavistock across the pond or the Laurel Canyon oh. studios and so forth. And, and I even talked to, to Dr. Uh, Reisman before she died, who did so much research on, on Alfred Kinsey and his connections to Playboy oh. and, and pushing yep. the feminist uh, pornography that we just see rampant yep. today. But it all connects and it's so so disheartening yeah, I so i kind of get it sometimes when people don't yeah, want to a, a, do this a show a few weeks ago about the beatles yeah and show that they clearly could not have, have done this it's clearly impossible for 20 and 21 year old guys to have written uh without knowing how to read music uh to have written such uh, uh constructed um uh music and lyrics and you know, and 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 we pretty much proved that it, that that, the, that it was a whole organization behind him, and it's Tavistock, and mm -hmm. it was behind the Beatles, and you know, they the songs were written for them. We have newspaper clippings saying that the Beatles had several songs written for them. Um, we have several really good drummers who said that they played on, on many of the Beatles songs. Um, uh, um, uh, George Harrison uh, in the first five albums of the Beatles uh, sounds like uh, Chet Atkins, the country <laughs> western guitarist. But then after those albums, he never again plays country western guitar again, ever, even though he's like as good as Chet Atkins in the first five albums. But after that, he's now I'm not playing that stuff anymore. It's like, right, you bet. It probably was Chet Atkins, to be Could honest be. with you. You know, and, and we know that the whole music business, and I'm going to say the movie business, I don't believe, for instance, that Quentin Tarantino is writing his scripts. Hmm. I think that's a, a group effort um, and that Quentin Tarantino's films have a specific cultural purpose. And I, I'm going to someday go and, and talk about this at length. But I see, here's what I see with Quentin Tarantino. I see that he's being given propaganda scripts to direct, right? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it. He, in fact, hates it. And so he slips stuff in his movies to show his disdain for this thing that's going on, right? So he's, he's given a script to make... Um, uh, the Germans look bad and that the Jews actually fought back against the Germans in glorious yeah, past. Yep. Right. Okay. So, you know, you thought, Oh, this is a, a propaganda film. Clearly, absolutely a propaganda film and everything. But then he slips things in that movie, which indicate that he's at odds with what he's doing. Um, so, uh, 
the the Papa Bear, I think his name is, uh, the big, huge guy that um, has a baseball bat with him all the time. Oh, yeah. Um, he sounds like a girl when he talks. He's talking like a girl. Right? You're like, wait a minute. Why did Quentin Tarantino do that? Right? And then the whole idea that they're going to trap the Germans in a movie theater. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, that's very interesting. Sounds You're like something out of Gremlins. It's exactly out of Gremlins, actually. It's kill them all. <laughs> Right. It's like, hmm, so you're using movies to attract them in and then you're going to kill them all. All right. Right. And over and over he does that like, over and over. And what I see here, it, 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 he did it in also um, uh, 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 Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where he inverted the whole idea that the hippies killed um, Sharon Tate and uh, Roman Polanski's friends, yeah. right? Which was probably, by the way, a drug deal gone wrong, um, and, and nothing like they're 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 making it out to be. It's, it was very clear that they were all into drugs, and that Manson was using the, those guys to sell drugs, and uh, somebody got in an argument, as it frequently happens in a drug deal, and everybody started killing everybody, and um, but. What um, what he what what Quentin did was, and I think that's his best film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. What he did so cleverly was, you know, you're showing the old Hollywood dying and the new Hollywood coming in, and that the and the new Hollywood was all drugs and sex, and um, but Brad Pitt represents old Hollywood, and so and he hates hippies, right? He hates hippies. And so when they break into his house, because they got the wrong house at the end, which is hilarious, by the way, you know, this guy killed his wife. He beat up uh, Bruce Lee. Right? <laughs> he starts ripping up the hippies and beating them all up and everything. And it's like Tarantino was supposed to make a movie uh, about the Manson family thing. And you know, to for the propaganda purposes, and then he's like, "No, no, I'm not doing that. No, no, they're going to break into the wrong house, and I'm going to have Brad Pitt kick their asses in, right?" Yeah. And see, so I think he's, you know, you can get away with a little bit of this in Hollywood, right? Yeah, you can you can, can go move away from the prescripts a little bit, and that's all he's doing. He's doing it in Kill Bill. He's doing it in, especially in Inglorious Bastards, and that other one with. Um, uh, 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 Django. Okay. Uh, yes. So, so Django is taught how to be, um, a killer by the doctor, right? Who's the only sophisticated. Again, if you go back to Inglorious Bastards, the only people in that movie that are dressed nicely, that talk sophisticated, that are articulate, and uh, immaculate are the Germans. Yeah. Go watch it. Mm -hmm. It's the Germans that are the ones that are shown in the best light. Same thing in Django. The guy that teaches Django, that great German actor who's in uh, Inglorious Bastards, he, um, he teaches Django, and then Django kills him at the end, and everybody. And the end. And that's again, I think Tarantino going off script and saying, okay, think about the implications of that. Okay. What he's saying is, is that this this really nice white guy teaches this slave all the ways to talk and sh and then how to shoot and everything, right? Mm -hmm. And then he kills them all. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, Quentin. That's actually kind of a racist um, thing, yeah. to be honest with you. I mean, this might it's be actually, a little bit off the menu, but it's definitely in the vein of the, the movies. Uh, I'm thinking you got some insight on this, because I sort of noticed, movie-wise, you know, World War II movies, John Wayne, all this glorification, we'll get them, rah, rah, rah. And then we get to the Vietnam era, and it's vastly these really negative portrayals of Vietnam. I mean, whether, you know, pick your Vietnam movie, it's almost always dark and yeah. and sort of the, the negative side of the war. And then here we are with the, the never-ending Middle East war 
has been vastly positive. I couldn't help but notice there's sort of a skip in the record there with the Vietnam narrative, whether or not you're looking at, at Kubrick or Oliver Stone or, or what have you. They're, they're dark. They're not like, go get them, uh, Sands of Iwo Jima, John Wayne. It's, man, we really messed up. Look at all this atrocities and, and darkness well, that we, we put out there. We're the bad guys in all those movies. Yeah. Apocalypse Now and Full Metal Jacket and uh, Platoon. We're the bad guys. Yep. All right. So that that what, what the powers that be realized was that the American military had to be emasculated. Mm. Um, it was just too strong. And so that was the beginning of the process of, oh, we're the bad people. You know, we're the bad people. We're doing all the bad stuff. And then people don't want to join the military. And then pretty soon the major force that uh, that could be against you can't be against you anymore. And that seems to be what's going on in every level. Any Anybody that can organize, whether it be churches, unions, um, any place that people can come together in any kind of organized fashion is being destroyed. Mm-hmm. Um, in, when I was young, everybody went to the neighborhood bar at night and you got all the, all the information from all your friends and neighbors about what was going on and everything. And then in the 1970s, they, you know, you can't go to the bar and drink anymore. Right. So now mm-hmm. that's gone, right. Cause you'll get caught drunk, drunk driving and yeah, I'm not I got you. driving mm-hmm. drunk, but you know, it froze it out. Now bars all disappeared. They're almost all gone now. Right. And, they, or they became sports bars, which are even worse. <laughs> Because yeah, then you're not talking to anybody who's watching sports. So, um, and we see this at every level. Um, and that's why they're after the churches. They're not after churches necessarily because they're, they're after them because it's a way that people can voluntarily come together without um, authorities' sanctions. And so this is happening at every level. And, um, and, and the COVID was the, uh, like the end of the social world that we used to have and now there is no social world anymore and half the uh, half the public is completely freaked out and thinks they're going to catch a disease and the other half um thinks exactly the opposite and we're living in two well, there's literally two movies going on mm-hmm. in this country today <clears throat> and the people that are watching movie a have no idea what movie B is about. And the people watching movie B have no idea what movie A is about. And when they get together to talk about the two movies that they're watching, they can't even understand what they're talking about. Like, what? What are you talking about? You know? And you know, yeah. their movie is, you know, the men can be women and women can be men. And this movie over here saying, oh, women are women and men are men. And by the way, this is another thing. In... In all of the natural law that all successful societies follow, right, there's all one law that's always there, always. And you can go back into history, all the way back to the Greeks, Romans. It's that there is a male and a female side to everything. Mm-hmm. So there's always going to be a male and there's always going to be a female, always. Life cannot go on without. They can't be mixed together. They have to be separated. That's the whole point. And to what I believe that they're doing is they're confusing men and women so that later they can confuse adults and children. Mm-hmm. That's Absolutely. where I think this is going. Yep. And that plays right into what I was talking about a moment ago with uh, with Alfred Kinsey sort of infiltrating yep. with uh, Hugh Hefner and the normalization Ugh. of pedophilia with all his just grotesque studies yeah, with babies and infants. I mean, the, the whole thing's turning out to be CIA. Yeah. We know that he was CIA funded by the CIA. We know Hefner got his original money to do Playboy from CIA funded sources. The Playboy Mansion, the cameras all over it. Hefner's bringing all the big wigs in, <laughs> putting Playboy bunnies with them, shooting everything. Probably a lot of the Playboy bunnies were underage unknowingly. They say, "Oh, did you see your birth certificate? Oh, did you know you had sex with the 15 year old? I think your wife would like to see this." Mm-hmm. And you know, oh, okay, I'll do it whatever you want you know and this stuff is like um clearly shown in like movies like the godfather 
the uh, Godfather II, the senator says, I hate you, Guinea's coming here and taking over Las Vegas. And then he's caught with a woman yep. like three scenes later, right? You know, he exactly. killed a woman that he didn't kill. He couldn't remember anything because he'd been clearly drugged. And uh, so, yeah. And um, and so we have like a, 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 a criminal cabal and it's running our propaganda machines and its purpose, I would say, one of its purposes is to destroy all competition. So it doesn't want any competition. It wants to be the sole top dog on the heap. It doesn't want any would-be alpha males coming anywhere near it. So they're basically getting rid of all the alpha males. Anyone who can rise up and get other people to rise up um, is going to be destroyed. And that's it right there in a nut bucket. And I heard somebody else saying this uh, just recently, but they were basically saying that no matter how many of these stupid titles and pronouns people want to put on each other, when the proverbial stuff hits the fan, we're all the dust is going to settle and we're still going to have those masculine and feminine roles. The, the women aren't going yeah. to want to go out there and hunt the deer and drag it back to camp, and the men aren't going to want to process the, the maize or the vegetables, if you will. It's just not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen and um, uh, uh, at all. And, you know, uh, I, I like to think that all this stuff that we're talking about is the result of a society that doesn't have to the stress of producing its own food mm -hmm. uh, and, protect, and protecting its, its family members uh, from harm, which is what men are supposed to do, is provide the meat and protect their families. Interestingly enough, Avatar 2, the movie is about that. So I don't know what, what's going on there. It's the biggest hit of the year, and it's about a guy who protects his family. Interestingly enough, he's got two daughters and two sons. The sons are the hunters, and the daughters are the gatherers. So it's like, what is what is what is James Cameron doing here? Like he's like returning us back to like the former values suddenly, and then it's a big hit, right? And like, yeah. huh. Because I was really thinking he was going to go woke, right? I yeah. really was. He had 13 years between the films. And I'm like, he's going to go woke here. Watch out. Watch <laughs> out. You know, Hollywood's going to force it on him, right? And then he kind of didn't go woke. I'm not saying that. He, it's woke. Don't get me wrong. It's woke. It's environmentally woke. Yeah, of course. But um, it's just interesting that he kept traditional um, roles for the characters. That's all. Yeah, I was thinking about this sort of in closing, and I was thinking about it when I was preparing for the show a little bit earlier. Is just how long has this notion of popular culture even been around? Because I feel like it's something uh -huh. that's a, a vastly new phenomenon. You know, like a hundred years ago, I don't think George Washington was worried about popular culture. I think they were worried about surviving and subsistence and that sort of stuff. It seems to be, yeah. again, kind of connecting dots to the CIA and the the Nazi ties which yep. parallels those ancient ties. It seems to be a, I don't know, what, 80, 90 years uh, in the making? Uh, it's about 100 years ago as uh, Hollywood really started going. 120 years ago is when films were invented, and or 125 years ago. And, um, you know, it's, it's put together by uh, – uh, uh, a group of people who have a extremely leftist orientation. The founders of Hollywood were all uh, New Yorkers who came out to California, get away from Edison, charging them int uh, money for their cameras. Uh, and so they could use them illicitly in California because Edison didn't have agents out there. And they had 360 days of sunshine, so they could shoot 360 days a year. And um, and it was six guys. So Al uh, Zucker, um, I could name them all. The six New York Jews um, who started Hollywood. They didn't make movies. They didn't start movies. Movies were invented by white guys. Uh, D.W. Griffith and uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin. And uh, they, they figured out how all the language of movies, right? Mm -hmm. But these six businessmen were smart enough, got to give them credit, to see how this could really be used and made a lot of money too. And so they went off to Hollywood and created Hollywood and brought with them drugs, sex, and not rock and roll, but 
uh, a lot of uh, nasty stuff that's in that movie Babylon, and that's all true. That's all true. They really were drug head, um, sex maniac, not the six heads, Hollywood was. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Murder City, the whole thing. I mean, somebody someday will tell the story of Hollywood, and it's not a pretty sight. So, um, yeah, and so, but it really got going after World War II. Yeah. So it was just a smattering of going. People were going to the movies and everything. But after World War II, they already invented television, so they put it out. And then uh, color movies came out, and um, movies took a real dark turn also. Film noir, all of a sudden movies were no longer fun, happy things to go to. Now they're filled with murder and deceit and uh, wife swapping. And and they tried to bring it back in the 60s into some kind of lively uh, happiness. And then the 70s, it went dour again, and it's really never come back. And there will movies will never come back it's pretty much a dead art form at this point yeah i mean for me personally i just can't even watch I and i hate either. to be an old guy like anything from this century virtually is just mess i can't you either know? <laughs> don't say it nicely. In, i'm completely bored at 10 minutes in i'm grabbing my laptop and i'm starting to look at stuff on the internet <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm just bored. In 20 minutes, I'm like, you know, I don't want to waste my life on this. Click. I turn it <laughs> off. So I'm the same way. I cannot watch a movie anymore. I wonder if it's my um, attention span is being destroyed somehow because I really don't have the attention span to watch a two-hour film. Yeah. I mean, the last two things my wife and I went to see were when they replayed some old movies. We went to see Jaws and, and something else where they replayed them on the big screen. I was like, this is great, but I wouldn't watch any of this other mess for a it was free. So. Yeah, Josh is a great film. Very exciting film. Yeah, no, it's, it's like they, they just don't. Also, you know, here's the thing. When, to be a writer is to um, experience life. Okay. So when I was young and I wanted to be a writer, I went to a very famous writer who was signing books at a book thing. And I said, I want to be a writer like you. What do I do? He said, um, run away from home hitchhike, join the merchant marines, join the military, uh, get in a lot of fights, uh, get drunk, have sex a lot. I was like, well, what? I'm trying to be a good writer. He goes, that's how you'll be a good writer. Yeah. Right? I went, ah, yeah, experience. And so the writers today don't have that. They're coddled in their homes and they're coddled in their schools. And so they don't really, um, their parents protect them. They're helicopter parents and and so the kids don't really have any experiences to draw upon when they're writing. And that's really the problem with today. That's a good point. It's like that Jackie yep. Robinson thing. Life's not a spectator sport. It's experiential. We got to get out there and do it a little bit. Absolutely it is. You got to get out there every day and get your ass kicked in. That's the only way you'll understand this world. <laughs> that's the truth. Well, Jay, where can people find you, follow you, and support you? And I got to get you back on to talk about this Stanley Kubrick stuff as well. If you're going to do an, another one, I want to hear about that too. Yeah. So Reality Check is my YouTube show. Just type in Jay Widener Reality Check. I'm at www.jaywidener.com. And uh, all of my movies are up on sacredmysteries.com or at gaia.com. Perfect. Well, if you'll stick around for a second, I'll close things up and say goodbye to you off the air here. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Well, folks, if you missed any of that, shame on you. But luckily, you can go to anomicage.com and see the video and the audio there. As I always say, you can't do everything, but you can do something. So please try to get out there and do your part. Until next time, I'll be seeing you sooner than later in the Anomic Age. Thank you for listening to The Anomic Age, a John Age project. For past shows, further info, and to comment, go to anomicage.com. That's A N O M I C A G E.com. Till next time, thank you for listening to The Anomic Age. I'm <laughs> sorry.